and welcome to our service for Money Feast Parish Church. We are at the end of February already, if you can believe it. It is the second Sunday in Lent and today's service will look ever so slightly different from what we've had in the past week. So I hope you enjoy it. I hope you get something from it and I hope you find yourself drawn closer to the ever-loving God who created us, redeems us and sustains us all. Let us worship God. Praise you, ruler of heaven and earth, for the wonder of creation around us, the breath of life within us, the gift of love between us. And we submit to your sovereignty, not out of fear or as a bargaining tool, but as a heartfelt, soul-longing response to your grace. Forgive us for the blame we heap on others, seeing the faults of all around us, gossiping and slandering about things we know not. Forgive us for missing the importance of context, where environment and societies impact human and non-human life in ways we struggle to notice. Forgive us for our complicity in the heart of others and help us to see how we might turn further towards your love so we might be filled with peace and better able to seek out justice. 
our souls praise you, ruler of heaven and earth. For you have created us and healed us, forgiven us and restored us. All we are and all we have comes from you, everlasting God, and we rest in your love without end. Receive the worship we offer this day, however we are feeling and whatever we are carrying, for we pause now in your presence to grow in strength and faith, maturing to bear fruits of your spirit as we follow the example of Jesus and pray in his words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. As I mentioned last week, throughout Lent, we're going to be following Jesus as described by the Gospel of Luke in his journey towards Jerusalem and then what happens in Jerusalem in the run up to his death. And this week, there's readings as he approaches Jerusalem and it's the one that is relatively well known where Jesus laments over Jerusalem, which gave me an idea. I thought maybe I could talk about a sense of lament that I felt when I went to Jerusalem in 2014. And I realised actually quite a lot will have changed in those six plus years. And then I remembered I have my good friend John McCulloch as the minister out in Jerusalem and I thought it's probably better to have a conversation with him. So today's service is now flipped a little bit. Instead of me preaching, I'm offering the conversation that John and I had because actually as we went through that conversation, I realised that much of what I wanted to tease out of scripture, John was offering in his talk about what was going on in the Holy Land. So in a moment, we're going to hear the scripture readings from Luke, and I'm going to give an initial reflection before there's a hymn, and then we'll go into the conversation that John and I had via Zoom on Friday night. Um, and during that conversation, I invite you to do a few things, perhaps. First and foremost, to really hear what John is offering us and, and the stories he's telling us about what life is like in Israel and the occupied territories of Palestine right now, happening as we worship together. And then perhaps it can broaden it out to our own lives today in Scotland and the individual, societal relationships and tensions that are there for us as well. Let's hear from the Gospel according to St Luke. At that time, some people were there who told Jesus about the Galileans whom Pilate had killed while they were offering sacrifices to God. Jesus answered them, Because those Galileans were killed in that way, do you think that it proves that they were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? No, indeed. And I tell you that if you do not turn from your sins, you will all die as they did. What about those 18 people in Siloam who were killed when the tower fell on them. Do you suppose this proves that they were worse than all the other people living in Jerusalem? No, indeed, and I tell you that if you do not turn from your sins, you will all die as they did. Then Jesus told them this parable. There was once a man who had a fig tree growing in his vineyard. He went looking for figs on it, but found none. So he said to his gardener, Look, for three years I have been coming here looking for figs on this fig tree, and I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it go on using up the soil? But the gardener answered, Leave it alone, sir, just one more year. I will dig round it and put in some manure. Then... If the tree bears figs next year, so much the better. If not, then you can have it cut down. 
continuing from verse 31. At that same time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, You must get out of here and go somewhere else, because Herod wants to kill you. Jesus answered them, Go and tell that fox, I am driving out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I shall finish my work. Yet I must be on my way today, tomorrow, and and the next day. It is not right for a prophet to be killed anywhere except in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you kill the prophets, you stone the messengers God has sent you. How many times have I wanted to put my arms round all your people, just as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not let me. And so your temper will be abandoned. I assure you that you will not see me until the time comes when you say, God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Christianity is not a religion of karma. We do not insist that what goes around comes around. For we have realised that bad things happen to good people and good things happen to those whom we consider to be bad. As the poet says, the sun shines on the righteous and the unrighteous alike. Within our faith, we hold on to this paradox that says that individual actions matter but the social structures and the power and the privileges they hold over people causes injustices to be perpetuated. They see innocent people crushed, pilgrims slaughtered, refugees left in limbo and the most vulnerable to die. And yet, for the broken, oppressive systems to change, we need the transformation of individual hearts, souls and minds. The call of Christ is to return to God, to be nourished by God's love, grow in God's likeness and bear good fruit. May we hear this call to nourishment this Lent.
John, thank you for joining us. How are you today? Hi, Fee. Um, yeah, I'm doing well, thanks. And it's, it's great to be able to have the opportunity to chat with you and with your with your congregation. I really appreciate your time. Um, I realise it's an incredibly busy time and a job out there for you to do. So thank you for your time. Um, on a, as we're recording this, a Friday evening. Um, I wonder if we could start from um, you telling the congregation where you're at, where the church is, um, just so they've got a, a slight idea of, of that kind of job. If you are. So my name is John McCulloch and I'm the minister of St Andrew's Jerusalem and Tiberias Church of Scotland. Um, I'm based here in Jerusalem, although I actually live in Bethlehem on, um, on the other side of the wall. Excellent, thank you. And you, there's now been this linkage, is it, between um, St Andrew's and Tiberius? Is that right? Um, it's actually a union. Um, so yes, it's a union. And we also have the Presbytery of, um, of Jerusalem. So, um, and the Minister of Jerusalem is also the moderator of Presbytery. Um, so it's all a bit, it operates very differently to how it would in Scotland, but um, I won't bore you with, with, with that just now. I'm um, just saying that because many in our congregation will know Kate MacDonald has just left at the post in Tiberias, so it's just making those connections. Um, so what was it uh, that took you out to be the minister out in Jerusalem three years ago? So I should say to your congregation that, that um, your minister, Fee, and I trained together. Um, we went through all of our training, so we're very good friends. Um, and um, it was actually Fee in my second year I spent my summer placement um, in Jerusalem. It was my first time in the Holy Land. Um, I was very struck by what I saw, very struck by what the Church of Scotland is trying to do here, um, both within Israel and also supporting uh, the Palestinian communities in the occupied territories. Um, and then when I came back during my training, ministry training, I was asked to come on to the World Mission Council. Um, and that also meant that I was out here doing bits of work for them, which meant I came out several times after that. So when, um, when my predecessor left to retire um, and, the, and the charge became vacant, I just felt completely drawn, drawn to it and um, yeah. And kind of like um, me coming here to Money Feed, that the, the vacancies happened at kind of the right time for both of us, didn't they? So, to, to go through those. Yes, they did. Um, and I think I was the last um, of our cohort um, for you to be ordained um, just because of the complexities of organising and ordination out here. It's the first time that the Presbytery of Jerusalem has ordained a minister in Jerusalem. And I had the privilege of being ordained on, on Palm Sunday. Um, here in Jerusalem. It so happened that we, that there was um, a group of um, ministers out from one to one staff. Um, they all happened to be here. So we were quarret and there was enough people to do it. So that's um, that's how it happened. And I know from some of your um, posts since then that Palm Sunday in Jerusalem is a pretty big deal. It's a nice big festival. It's fabulous day to be a day. Yeah, Palm Sunday um, is is an incredible event here to witness. I mean, obviously, last Palm Sunday, this one were cancelled because of COVID, but but normally thousands and thousands of Christians from across Israel and the Palestinian territories, they have, those have permission to come. And also pilgrims, um, you know, process down from the Mount of Olives, waving olive branches, following the route that, that Christ did as he entered Jerusalem. And they lay palm um, branches down on the ground, and um, it's a wonderful atmosphere. People worshiping and singing, and um, yeah, very joyful atmosphere, and and brought alive really by being in the place where 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 it happened. So you've been out there three years, and when I thought about maybe having um, doing this, I thought about. Uh, talking about my time out there in, in 2014. So I think that means I was out before you. Um, but I, I was out in uh, 2014 just for a week um, and, I, and that had an impact on me, a lasting impact uh, on me. Um, but I thought actually a lot has changed in the last six and a half years or whatever. Um, 
and I imagine a lot's happened in the last three years since since you've been um, the minister out there. Tell us a little bit about how you've seen things change in Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Israel, Palestine. It's been a very difficult um, time, um, especially for the for the disenfranchised and occupied Palestinians, because of the Republican, the previous um, Republican administration. Um, and their policies, it's really emboldened those on the right here, on the Israeli right, to push forward with, um, with issues which are deeply contentious and which are obstacles to um, finding a just peace, like settlement expansion deep into the West Bank, um, house demolitions, um, and so on. So it's been a difficult time. And then add COVID into that as well. Um, it's, been, it's been really tough. But I think before we discuss more of the intricacies of the of the conflicts and the difficulties here, I want to say one thing, which I usually say to groups when they come, and that is any solution to the intractable and long-standing problems here in the Holy Land, I think has, has to do four things, and not in any particular order. It needs to be a solution that is pro-Israeli, pro-Palestinian, pro-justice and pro-peace. And there are ways of being pro-Israeli that make you anti-Palestinian, and there are ways of being pro-Palestinian that make you anti-Israeli, and we need to try and avoid that. But in articulating it like that, it's important that I'm not giving the impression that this is a kind of battle of equals. Um, whilst there is blame on all sides at various stages, of course, um, this is an asymmetrical situation. Most of the power lies, of course, with the occupying, um, with the occupying side, with the Israeli side. Um, and um, and, and the Palestinians um, have been living under under the yoke of occupation for you know for far too long. And just so that we're clear around what we what you mean by settlements, um, my understanding is that when the the current kind of borders were drawn around the West Bank and the Gaza Strip in 1967, I think, um, that they were the bits that would become a Palestinian state and that was going to be their territories. But since then, there's been a lot of, of Israeli incursion into those bits of land um, and building on it and, and taking of land and, and all that kind of stuff. So the settlements, when we talk about settlements, that is really homes built on land that was kind of set aside for the Palestinians. Is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Um, and um, it's happened exactly as you described, Fee. Um, there are over, well, there's probably about 700,000 approximately Israeli settlers who are living deep within the occupied territories on land that's been expropriated or um, acquired by other means. Um, and these settlements are seen internationally as a huge obstacle for peace um, and for a just solution because um, they're cantonizing, they're fragmenting the West Bank into little pockets. Um, and whenever you have a settlement and all the settlers are armed, you then have settler roads, you then have security zones, um, you have a very unequal system because the settlements have, um, are connected to water and electricity. A lot of the communities around them are not. Um, I mean, in fact, today, earlier today, I was down in the South Hebron Hills visiting a Bedouin community who live in shacks, basically, um, in tents. And they are just outside a settlement. Um, the settlement has electricity, it has water, it has all of the amenities. They don't have electricity or water. They even dug a well to try and um, have water for their animals. And the, um, the IDF came along and cemented it over. Um, so there's a real struggle um, for the Palestinians living in that situation. Um, and it's one of the, the, the biggest obstacles to finding a, a solution um, um, under international law. It's, it's quite clear that, that it's illegal. Yeah. And also, beyond it being illegal, it just becomes more complicated to resolve. Um, so I remember when I was there um, and went to Hebron and, and the areas that have essentially become apartheid you know there's there's streets that Palestinians can't walk down and things and I remember a family walking up one of the roads in Hebron and there was a little um Jewish boy and 
I don't know, he must have been about four or five. And I remember just kind of him walking up to me, my heart breaking for him because I thought, this is your home actually as well. You know, you're, you're going to grow up in this environment, but you know, this is going to be your home. And then if there's going to be a two state solution, you're going to have to move somewhere else. And it's, you know, we've, we've had decades of this kind of entrenchment of, of whose land becomes whose in some ways, you know, it, it, it's just so, become so complicated because of this kind of the settlement um, policies. Absolutely. And um, this afternoon when I was down in this Bedouin village, and by the way, it's called Umal Khair. If any of you want to read about it further, just go onto the Church of Scotland World Mission page, partner page, and I've written letters, well, partner letters about it. But through the fence, I can see Jewish um, and Israeli children playing on the other side. Um, and they too are victims of this because they're being brought up with a narrative, narratives of fear of the other, narratives of suspicion. Um, by no fault of their own, they're being fed these, the, these narratives from their, from their parents, which will become deeply entrenched. Um, and I think that's the thing which, when I say to my children, my children who are used to going through checkpoints and seeing soldiers and, and then meeting with Jewish friends for Shabbat meals on a Friday evening and you know, moving around between the different communities, I say to them, Whatever you do here, we need to be very careful not to dehumanize the people who are caught up in this. And that's not to take responsibility away from, from the wrong that is happening. But I came through a checkpoint today. Um, the girl is 18 years old, who's a soldier. Um, she's conscripted. All Israeli youths have to do two or three years in the army. The problem isn't with that 18 year old girl with the machine gun at the checkpoint. The problem isn't with her as a human being. She's caught up in a situation which is, is bigger than herself. The problem is with the, with the structures of injustice. Um, and it's very easy here to, to come in to start dehumanizing individuals because of the role they are. Um, and I think we need to see the humanity in people. Um, of course, call out the injustice and do what we can to stand in solidarity with those who are being occupied and marginalized, of course, um, but to see the human being. Um, and I'll give you an example of this last week, a couple of weeks ago now. And Fee, this is on my Facebook page if you're wanting to actually reference, um, there's a few clips which we put up there. One of the Church of Scotland partners here are an organization called Rabbis for Human Rights. And as the name suggests, they are Jewish, Israeli, um, rabbis who are deeply critical of what's being done in the name of their government in terms of the occupied West Bank. So they go into West Bank villages, they rebuild homes that have been demolished, they replant olive trees that are being uprooted by settlers who are trying to intimidate um, the Palestinians off their land. Um, and they also pray on the hillside and, um, and engage with the soldiers and try and stand up for justice. So I was with them a few weeks ago. Um, I'd been on many such um, trips with them. And we were planting these olive trees. And there were armed settlers coming down the hill with guns to try and intimidate. And then the army was there as well, trying to push us off the hill. And it got a bit, there are a few kind of scuffles and it got a bit heated. Um, and then they started singing Jewish um, songs of worship and and they asked me to, to do a prayer as well. And in my prayer, I, um, I, I thank God for being there with our, with our Palestinian brothers and sisters, with our Israeli brothers and sisters. But I also referenced the army and I referenced them as also being brothers and sisters made in the image of God. Um, and at one point they used these sound bombs to try and get us off the hill. Um, and I went up to one of the soldiers and I think he's expecting me to begin shouting at him or perhaps swearing, which is what usually happens. But I just looked him in the eye and I said, look, I, I realize that this is, you've not got an easy role here. And it completely changed the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, he, was, he was quite shocked that I would say that. Um, 
and it, it almost disarmed disarmed him. Um, in some ways, it would have been easier for him if I just gone up and been aggressive. They know how to deal with that. But by seeing the human being, and I saw the discomfort in in his eyes and in, in what he was doing, it almost unlocks something. Um, and the reason I say that is simply that I think as people of faith um, moving through this contested situation, the world doesn't need more angry um, activists. It needs um, people who can see the injustice and see the problems and, of course, lament that and do what we can to change it, but also to see the human beings who are caught up in these structural issues, which are much bigger than themselves. That's interesting. When I was there um, in the, is it Al Ada camp in Bethlehem, uh -huh. is um, judged right up against the separation wall. Um, and there was some, two parts of what you were saying came to mind for me. One was the fact that I was looking at this refugee camp, and I never to that point had assumed that refugee camps could be built of concrete, but Al Ada is. Um, and, it's, and it's kind of all on top of each other, and you know, it's, it's it's a very cramped space to live in. And then on the other side into Israel, the other side of the wall, was beautiful housing and all very green and swimming pools and all this kind of stuff. It was a really interesting contrast of that, that wall that made a difference. So that sense of being very near neighbors, but yet worlds apart and that, that power in that. But the other thing that came to mind was um, just outside the camp, there was these little boys, maybe seven, eight, nine, um, that I could imagine playing chatty um, in Glasgow or, or, or Monifique or something at that age. But all the, what they were doing was throwing stones towards the, the IDF um, soldiers on top of the wall. Um, and, but instead of having the response of, you know, somebody coming out their, their door and going, yeah, you're a young scoundrel, stop being a thing. He opened fire with rubber bullets and um, tear gas canisters. And, and, I, and they did it in front of 40 plus Western witnesses as well. You know, there was a whole group of us seeing this happen. And I just remember being one, shocked, but two, just so angry. And and, and I'm really struck about that sense of seeing the humanity in, in every person that's there. Um, and I'm wondering if, I mean, I'm supposed to, a lot of people think I'm an angry person to begin with, and I probably am. Um, but I wonder if actually, given the time that you spent there and the interactions you've had with so many different people, that that's allowed you to see humanity in a way with me just dipping in, getting angry and leaving. Well, first of all, I think there is a place um, for righteous anger when you're seeing that being done to children, absolutely. And the children of Ida Camp, you've got to remember, they've been brought up in a context of, of violence. Um, there are so many night raids at night um, where soldiers come in and kick down the doors. And there's a lot of PTSD um, with the children who have known nothing but rubber bullets and conflict. So, yeah. Absolutely, it's um, it, it's horrific what's going on, and it needs to be named as you as you've done. I think, as the minister here, as the church called minister, one of the privileges and one of the responsibilities is that you do get invited into every aspect of society. So, you know, I've been to the president of Israel's house. Um, I've met with rabbis in Jerusalem and other spiritual leaders. I go into Gaza, so I meet um, people there, um, Hamas officials at the border and so forth. You really get to see everything. Um, and with Bedouins who've lost their homes deep in the West Bank. Um, and I remember, um, I think a couple of years ago, I, I, I was just back from Gaza, um, a trip in Gaza, and um, I was running late with my sermon prep. And so, I thought, do you know what? I'm going to go and sit in the sun. I have a beer and see if um, if any inspiration comes. So I was um, sitting, having a beer with my dog collar and reading. And I was approached by a man and a woman in civilian clothes who were quite intrigued about this priest with a beer. And, and we got chatting. And they asked me who I was and what I was doing. So I told them a bit about, I said, I'm a priest. They don't understand the word minister. They think they're in politics. I said, I'm a priest in Jerusalem and the Church of Scotland here is trying to build bridges between the communities and we try and do this and that. We got chatting. 
And um, and they asked me what I'd been up to this week. So I said, well, I'm just back from Gaza. Um, and after they just about picked themselves up off the floor, we had a really interesting conversation. And it transpired that both of them um, had been pilots in the 2014 um, Gaza campaign. Um, and they had both suffered post-traumatic stress disorder from what they had done, um, the commands that they had followed. Um, so that's that's the kind of way it is here. You you are meeting people from from all sides, uh, and if we're able to see the humanity in these people caught up in in the in these situations without condoning what's being done, um, but seeing the humanity in them it enables you to engage with them on a different on a different level, um, on a level which I think is can be redemptive. Um, when you know when you're able to to not dehumanize, um, which doesn't mean to say that you don't um, stand up for you know for what is for what is right or or denounce what needs to be denounced. I wonder then whether actually the work that you're doing, rabbis for human rights, and, and a lot of other groups, in the sense of which change there is going to happen from the bottom up as, as individuals recognise the humanity of other individuals rather than necessarily a top down. Do you think that's... That, that just kind of came to me as you were, you were talking, that was my sense of change is only going to happen when the individuals recognise humanity, not necessarily from a political... I, th I think you're right and I think history is a record of that. I mean, if you, if you look back on the 20th century, um, arguably the most violent century in human history with the various world wars and so on. And yet when you think of the positive things that happened, whether it was the suffragette movement in the 1920s and um, the emancipation of women to vote and so on, whether it was Gandhi in India or whether it's the civil rights movement in the United States, all of those three things had one thing in common. It was grassroots, people on the ground communities, getting together, campaigning nonviolently to bring about change. Um, seldom do we have um, a record of history of, of the powers that be, those in power, making the right decisions. Um, I think history is a witness that it, it, it comes from below um, most, most of the time. And I think here it's, um, it's also the case. The difficulty, I think, is that the Palestinians, because of what you said earlier, um, Fee, are deeply fragmented. They're fragmented politically. They're fragmented in terms of their land. Um, they can't even move across the West Bank without going through checkpoints, internal ones, not just the ones along the Green Line, but internal ones. Um, and with COVID as well, the economy is on its knees. Um, and so people are just trying to put food on the table for their families. Um, and they've kind of lost hope that anything's really going to change um, for, the, for the better. And um, yeah, objectively, looking at it, on one level, they're right. Um, the situation has been getting more and more difficult, the occupation more and more entrenched, um, and yeah, difficult to maintain hope that things will change for the better in, in the current context. Yeah, I, I can only imagine what to live under COVID in, in circumstances that are so difficult to start with. Um, you know, it's been tricky enough here in Scotland, so never mind. Um, if you're worrying about whether or not you're going to have clean water or uh, food on the table and things. That's the sense of hopelessness. It's quite, it's quite hard. It, it's interesting you're saying about um, the, the couple that um, were involved in the, the Gaza um, conflict. I was there in September, not Gaza, I was in, in Jerusalem and Bethlehem in, in September 2014. And what was interesting about that was it wasn't long after that raid on, on Ga the 50 days bombing campaign in, in Gaza. Um, and it was also literally like three days, I went out three days after the, the independence referendum here in Scotland. Um, and if I take the second one first, every Palestinian that I spoke to, I was the one person there with a Scottish accent. They couldn't understand why we hadn't voted for independence, why we hadn't um, released the, the oppressors, if you like. Um, and I had to try and explain to them that my life in Scotland was not like their life in, 
in Bethlehem or, or Hebron or whatever it was, it was nightly day in comparison. Um, and so in some ways I get quite angry when people talk about us being oppressed or, or, or us being in a dictatorship when I kind of, you know, here when I've seen what's, what's going on out there. But the other thing was that was really interesting is that I was out there um, to be part of a conference that was talking about the role of, of women in, in what's going on in this sense that you know, mothers can make a difference. Um, we saw that happen a lot really in Northern Ireland and, and what have you. But because it was so close to what had been going on in Gaza and, and the, the death toll and the pain and the suffering, even the women who had a real heart for justice and peace were just so angry and upset and uh, that that came out in everything they said and how they said it, um, which, which made it a, a more difficult conference to be a part of. Um, and I, the reason I'm saying that is, 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 is those emotions that happen around what's going on in the Holy Land um, and the sense of Jesus lamenting over Jerusalem you know, what do you do? Is, is, is there hopelessness? Is there anger? Is there, is there lament? You know, what, when you look out from, you know, from the hotel in Jerusalem, out over the Oaks, what, what happens for you? What's going on for you? I think lament is, is a very pertinent word here. And I think it's a tradition in a sense, I think we've lost in the church. Um, and it's something which I've been trying to rediscover. Um, there's a book by Walter Brueggemann. Um, I don't have the title to the hand, but it's his Lenten Reflections. Um, and he touches on lament. Of course, throughout the Hebrew scriptures, there's this tradition of lament. Um, and for me, what lament does is that it's, it cries out to God that the world is broken, that we are broken, that things are not as they should be. They're out of kilter and that they, they need to change. Um, but it's also a protest, a protest against the injustice and the suffering and the, and the despair that is all around. But it does it differently to just angry activist protests because by connecting to God through lament, it changes us, it changes our heart and opens a space for God. And when there's a space for God, there's always compassion. There's always... Um, the reaching out to the other, whether within Judaism or Christianity or even um, in Islam, the, you know, the golden rule, um, the idea that we, we worship a God of compassion. So lament in a sense, it changes us um, and therefore it changes, it changes the world. Um, and it causes us to, yes, to call out and to denounce that the world is not as it should be, um, but to seek the shalom or the peace of God to, to come into a situation and to, and to begin to change it, even if it's one person at a time. There's a sense that in, in Lemain, as opposed to angry activism, that you're, you're really engaging somehow with the, the love, the heart, the soul of God, that kind of, you know, that anguish, that, that loving something so much and seeing so much um, potential and, and so much good, and yet, it's yeah i think it's um you know god as a parent or god as a, as a father um as as a, as a parent would see their children do wrong you, you don't stop loving the children because of that lament comes much closer to to what as a parent you'd feel you know heartbroken that that had happened but always i think with lament always with the possibility of reconciliation always with the possibility of, of restoration and restitution and a setting right as the prophetic traditions of the Hebrew scriptures remind us um, you know so beautifully in books like Jeremiah and Lamentations and some of the Psalms of Lament and so forth there's a great tradition there um, which um, for us to draw on yeah and we're not not so good at doing that in, in the church as we you might be though like you particularly over this last year try to tease out that a little bit more. Um, just to kind of round off a little bit, um, I wonder for those of us in Scotland. So we've um, we have been in Dundee Presbytery, a uh, uh, mission partner with whoever the minister in Tiberias is, and and, and, and we'll wait to see what happens there. Um, and 
and also um, Dundee as a city tw is twinned with the Palestinian town of Nablus. Have you been to Nablus? Is that a, an interesting place to know? Well, actually, if he, um, and you should, if you want to reference this further, go into my Facebook page. Um, but the olive planting episode, which I mentioned, was actually just outside Nablus. All right. Okay. So that, that's, a, that's a place that could do with a bit of solidarity and, and support. Um, so there's, there's, there's links um, in terms of, of this part of the world to your part of the world. Um, but other than that, what, what can we sit here in Money Faith or wherever someone's watching this across Scotland, what can we do to support you, your ministry, the, the people who live in their faith? I think pray for our Israeli and Jewish brothers and sisters and for our Palestinian brothers and sisters as well, um, that they would be able to see this place as, as shared. Um, um, I think pray for the work of the Church of Scotland here. Um, it's very challenging in terms of um, trying to build a church community and, and all of that. So please keep us in your prayers. And I think on kind of more practical levels, I mean, I know that, your congregation fee and the presbytery of, of Dundee is probably much more informed, much better informed than other presbyteries because you've got a mission partner. But, um, you know, visit the um, World Mission Council webpage where the partner letters are, have a read through. Maybe that, you know, one of the partners, whether it's Rabbis of Human Rights or um, Breaking the Silence or, you know, maybe grabs your attention and maybe go onto their websites and see what you can do in terms of advocacy or praying specifically or, um, you know, raising awareness about, about the issues. A big, a big part of my role here is um, to do advocacy. Um, so to write about what I see, to write about our partners and the work and to draw, try and draw that attention, not just to the church, but, um, but also to, to wider society when, when relevant as well. Okay, well, um, I don't know if you remember from our time in training, but I'm a bit rubbish at these uh, extemporary prayer types. So we will keep you and um, the partners and Israel Palestine in their prayers when we have our prayers of intercession during the service. Um, but in the meantime, I'd like to thank you very much for giving up what is at the moment Friday night um, and, and, and chatting to us. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. You're very, very welcome, Fee. It's great to um, be in touch with you again and, um, and great to connect with, um, with your congregation. Um, greetings from Jerusalem to you all. Um, have a blessed Sunday and thank you very much for your prayers and your support. I rejoiced when I heard them sing, let us go to the house of God. And now our feet are standing in your gates, O Jerusalem. Shalom, 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 the peace of God be near. Shalom, 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 God's justice be ever near. Like a temple.
of my friends and kin. I will bless you with signs of peace. For the love of God's own people, I will labor and pray for you. I have a number of intimations to share and reshare with you today um, and I'll start by saying that some of those um, links that John mentioned I will make available on our website and our Facebook page if you want to follow up some more. This Friday, it being the first Friday in March, is the World Day of Prayer and the service should have been led by the woman from Vanuatu this year. Those services are not happening in person, but if you wish to join a Scotland-wide service uh, on Zoom at two o'clock on Friday, um, let us know, we can give you the login details. Um, and if you're not online and would like to see that and you're uh, afterwards, we can make it available on DVD or CD, please just ask. We are now halfway through Fair Trade fortnight and as part of that myself and Caroline Taylor had a discussion about fair trade for the programme called Reflections from Dundee. Again I will make that available on website and Facebook page if you're interested in hearing what Caroline and I have to say about fair trade. A reminder that the man's doorstep has a number of items for free or to swap. Please do not be shy at coming and using those things. We had our second virtual coffee morning of this year yesterday, so which means it's a fortnight to the next one on the 13th of March. You can join us via phone as well as online. Again, just be in touch um, and we'll give you those details. A little bit of exciting news. Adam Elder has gained a place at Edinburgh Napier University. He had hoped to go to Glasgow, but with uh, the current restrictions, that wasn't going to happen. So he's dead chuffed to be going to Edinburgh. So big congratulations to Adam as he looks forward to starting uni in September. And from the excitement of life to the grief of death, a reminder that Ian Piggott's funeral is at 11.30 this coming Tuesday, the 2nd of March. And Margaret Ware's funeral has now been confirmed as 11.30 on Wednesday, the 3rd of March. If there are funerals you wish to attend via Zoom, please get in contact with myself or Scott and we will make those details available to you. These are my intimations for today. Cara says hello and we move to our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. We add to our prayers the ancient words, Ubi caritas et amor, Ubi caritas Deus ibi est. Where there is charity and love, God is there. Let us pray. Gracious, merciful and patient God, you are the source and end of love, an infinite outpouring of concern and compassion for all of creation. You call us to acts of justice and love for each other. And so where we see charity and love, you are present and we give thanks. We give thanks for the access we have to necessities and comforts of life alike. We lament the lack of equity across our communities and our world. We pray for all who are struggling in some way, shape or form, sleeping rough, sofa surfing or facing homelessness, lack of affordable nutritious food and clean water, not enough clothes to stay safe, or heat to stay warm, body or mind not working as hope, or society's structures causing further struggles.
We give thanks for the skills and passions of so many people, paid and voluntary, in our communities and around the world. You help transform lives each and every day. We pray for teachers, lecturers, professors, all who pass on knowledge, wisdom and skills. We pray for healthcare workers of all shades, cleaners and medical physicists, nursing assistants and surgeons. We pray for scientists and entrepreneurs who take us places we could never imagine. We pray for artists, musicians, writers and filmmakers who enrich our lives every day and yet struggling so much at the moment. We give thanks for the families who have raised and nurtured us. We pray for families of every flavour and hue, where emotions are raw and tensions are high, where everyone is exhausted and struggling to stay positive, where life has been lived apart for far too long, where milestones have been missed, weddings postponed, funerals unattended, and where new members have only been met at a distance. We pray for all who hear and respond to your call. We pray for all who are ministering in strange circumstances, be they close to home or far away. We pray for those whose ministry is not officially recognised, for all who share your love in quiet, unassuming ways. We pray for those discerning what your call might be, whether for the next stage of life or the next decision of the day. And as we give thanks for the ministry of the whole church, every traveller on the journey of faith, we pray that we would know patience and perseverance in the face of injustice. We give thanks for all who work for peace and justice in the Holy Land. We pray for the Church of Scotland in Israel and Palestine, in Jerusalem, Bethlehem and Tiberias. We pray for John and the ministry he is undertaking with compassion and wisdom, praying for his family who are separated from him at this time of COVID. We pray for the various organisations and groups who work for an end to conflict, a recognition of human rights, the flourishing of justice and a lasting peace. We pray for all our brothers and sisters, Israeli or Palestinian, Jew, Christian or Muslim, all whose day-to-day -day lives are caught up in a system bigger than them, all made in the image of God and all with the potential to enable transformation. Gracious, merciful and patient God, hear the silent prayers of our hearts the laments of our souls and the joys we want to share with you as we rest in your presence here and now.
we offer these and all our prayers to the name of Christ Jesus, Teacher and Saviour, and in the power of the ever-present Spirit. Amen. by God. In your questioning, may you glimpse God. In your lamenting, may you grow closer to God. In your frustrations, may you see through God's eyes. In your search for justice, may you demonstrate God's love to the whole world. And in and through all that, may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, rest upon you and all those whom you love this day and forevermore. Bye.